Motherboard has been the center of many conversations as of late, and in today's video, we're going to look at its price actions, the recent developments, the technicals, and my opinion on if you should be buying the stock. As the market is still very volatile at the moment, we should be mindful of which positions to pick, as well as their individual timing and exposure. Before the video begins, if you would like to see more stock analysis videos like this one, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Motherport has been under continuous sell-off pressure from the market all over the course of 2022 so far, and that tendency has been caused by a major correction in shareholders' goal when they invest in open markets, which resulted in a capital flight away from the growth stocks to other more predictable and arguably safer investment options, such as the fixed income and oil and gas. As we look closer to what Matterport does, it's clear that the company has an interesting technology and assets to deliver real services to customers. With that being said, the real issue lies elsewhere than the company's own fundamentals. Or rather, if we really want to look at what is the issue regarding the company's own fundamental itself, I would say that it's time. Matterport may need more time in order to start generating cash positive operations, and the market may not be ready to give it more, or it's going to pressure it further and further before the company starts to generate money by itself. Right now, it's been selling off for a significant amount of time, and the idea that the tech scene is going to undergo significant corrections has been already priced in very significantly so across the board. Along with the fact that investors may not have enough faith in the future to continue providing capital with the current conditions. So what I'm saying is, yes to valuations, yes to the fact that this is a tech stock which went through a major boom in 2020, and also the current conflicts going on as well as the interest rates. So really, the conditions are aligned for the stock to not really perform very well in the short term. And it's going to be at least very confusing. I believe that Matterport will eventually succeed at convincing the market that it is a stock worth investing into. And right now, the market is still correcting downward. But it's possible that the low has been reached since May of this year, and that it would require a lot more catalysts to go further down. Now, let's take a look at the technicals of Matterport. The trading volume of Matterport has recently been 3.4 million shares versus an average volume of 7.5 million shares. Over the previous 52-week period, the price fluctuated between $3.51 and $37.60. The trading volume is a metric that can tell you how many shares have been exchanging hands, and it's also a demonstration of how much activity and attention the stock enjoys. It often gives you a first-hand idea about how popular the stock is. When we use it to compare with the average volume, it can also tell us if the company is currently enjoying additional momentum in order to reverse or to break through the current resistance. Even when the current volume is lower than the average, it can be an interesting indication because it can signify that a trend reversal could happen sometime soon. The market cap of Matterport is currently at around $1.1 billion versus an enterprise value of $2.1 billion. To put simply, market cap is the fair market value the company has based on the current market sentiment, the company's reputation, and other macroeconomic factors, whereas the enterprise value is often the cost the company has already paid for its assets after paying off all the debts. It's worth mentioning that one of the most significant assets for a lot of the growth companies are the intangibles, meaning they may not be items that the company can use right now, but they're promises for a brighter future. And they include assets such as intellectual properties, brands, and schematics for new products. For startups, most of their valuations are based on the intangibles, valued in more favorable market conditions. Which means that for these companies, in concrete terms, what this means is that there can be a huge difference between the market cap and the enterprise value, giving a false impression to market participants that a company is trading at a discount. It's only trading below its book value, but doesn't mean that the company itself is necessarily undervalued. It's also possible that a company itself 
was overvalued in the first place and that it has deflated itself ever since. As we compare the current price to the historical price fluctuations, the stock is 9.7% higher than the one month low, 9.7% higher than the 12 weeks low, and 9.7% higher than the 52 week low. On the options market, which gives you a hint about the market sentiment, the implied volatility is currently 100% versus a historical volatility of 85%. The put call volume ratio is currently at 0.25 and it's normal for most stocks to also tend to have a higher put option volume than what they deserve as many institutional investors hedge their long positions by buying put options. The most recent volume of options traded has been 1.3 thousand contracts a day versus the 30 day average of 4 thousands. For open interest, the most recent volume of open interest has been around 203 thousand contracts versus about 203,000 contracts for the 30-day average. The option contract is a derivative from the underlying security, giving participants the possibility to have a right to either buy or sell the security at a predetermined strike price. Buying the contract gives you the right, and selling the contract gives you the premium, with an obligation to execute the contract should the counterparty chooses to do so as well. It is often said that you can evaluate the likelihood of a scenario based on the opposite what the current ratio is. If there's a lot of put options, there can be a possible uptrend on the move, or that a reversal could happen if there's a lot of call options. The reasoning behind the theory is very simple. Most options would expire worthless, and very often people rushing in to buy, say, put options expecting the stock to go further down or call options to buy the stock further up, they're already late to the party. In terms of the shareholder structure, institutional shareholders own about 8% of the outstanding shares. The biggest shareholders include Vanguard, Fidelity, and iShares. It's relevant to understand the shareholder composition of a company, as this helps to determine if you should hold the stock long-term or to view it as a trade opportunity. If the stock is mainly held by retail traders, this could be a sign that the stock lacks the depth to justify long-term holding. Typically, the consensus is that there has to be at least 25-30% to 30 of institutional presence for the stock to be seen as a sound investment. Obviously, there's a lot of exceptions to the theory since many great titles are also mostly held by retail, but that tends to be the exception and not the rule so far. Let's also take a look at the short interest present in the stock, which is the amount of positions aiming to profit should the stock price fall lower. Sometimes when there is significant short interest in the total volume, this is a sign that there's an organized shorting operation going on, such as what happened with GameStop and AMC. The current short interest is about 15% of the total float and 63% of the transactions coming out of the dark pools. Usually, if the short interest is above 15% of the total volume, with a significant portion of the short volume coming out from the dark pools, that can also suggest that there are institutional positions taken to short the stock, and there would be potentials for a short squeeze. My recommendation is to slowly build up a position in Matterport over the next 12 to 18 months, and to keep it for at least 6 months afterwards. My assumption is that the high interest rate environment will not truly last forever and that within the next two years or so, capital should begin to look around for tech and growth stocks once again. I would recommend to commit between 0.5 and 1% of your portfolio and would also further recommend to split the allocation in batches of 20% at a time so that you can purchase more in case it retraces. Now, given the current market environment, I believe that the equity market is in a vast phase of correction, especially when it comes to tech and growth type equities. The financial market has been living and breathing thanks to the continuous creation of new capital with different waves of quantitative easings, which will have consequences on the price of assets as well as their yields. With the interest rates kept relatively low over the years and the increase of amount of capital in circulation, this will keep putting significant pressure on the profit that we can expect the investment products across the board. And this, by the way, is a reality that may shift in the years to come if the interest rate of core infrastructures within our globally financialized system increases. 
It's useful to remember that the market doesn't represent the real economy, and of course, the real economy doesn't always reflect in the stock performance, since the name of the game here is ultimately called supply and demand, which depends on a whole bunch of factors that go way beyond our own control. If we think about it, this is like saying, if your neighborhood house that is put up for sale is only allowing those who actually want to live inside to buy it, versus if you allow every single type of buyer with different intent or reasons to buy or to sell it. So obviously, there will be a significant difference in the price of this asset for those two scenarios. The market currently works more like the second option, and assuming that it would only reflect the fundamentals of the underlying economy would correspond to the first option. There are a few elements that are considered to be the reasons. The first one is the significant increase of amount of money printed by the central banks around the world, which is then distributed to the banks with the expectation that they will be loaned to businesses. Normally, that's a good thing, but with a lack of opportunities in the real economy, the significant portion of that money actually went back to the financial system to buy up the price of existing assets. Now that the QEs have been wrapping up, or ended around the world, I think that this drive behind asset price may no longer be as relevant as it is right now for the future. It is now compensated by the arrival of capital from one region to another, and from one sector to another even within the same jurisdiction. With the increase of tensions around the world, capital is always looking for a safe haven to park their money into, not just for a place to grow the nominal value, but with a currency that tends to keep its purchasing power as well. The third factor is the creation or the birth of artificial bubbles either maintained by the market trends built up over the years or out of necessity. Capital needs to find a place to stay. Some good examples of this would include the EV sector in the 2020 and the oil and gas securities when there are tensions around the world. Either way, when it comes to the price trends of the market, the degree of uncertainty is a key drive behind the price fluctuations and that is likely going to increase as we go on from there. When company announce that they are going to enter or exit different markets, or that they will be trading on different platforms and exchanges, this can all have significant ramifications on the price of this asset. Some of the considerations to have when operating in this context include having a clear view of what is going on, especially regarding the cash flow and the capital flow, and avoid certain potential pitfalls. One of these is to be careful with short positions. Inherently, short positions are riskier than long positions as the downside of long positions is limited, whereas the short positions can lose you as much money as the stock price may reach, which is infinite. On top of that, we're now seeing a new phenomenon with short squeezes involving a group of retail traders propping the stock price up forcing short sellers to recover their positions. Sometimes the attempt will not succeed, but sometimes they end up in very spectacular success. Something else to consider is to treat tech stocks with care. To start ask questions when the price of a security skyrockets without real fundamentals. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't be touching it with a 10-foot pole, but it does mean that there should be a difference between the decision of long-term holding and short-term trading. Either way, a rule of thumb is that each position should be structured in a way so that their individual performances will never affect the portfolio's stability. Thank you for watching. If you like my content, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel.